Hello everyone, in this video we will be solving May June 2023 paper 2 variant 1 AS level chemistry. Question 1 Tellurium is an element in group 16. The most common isotope of tellurium is tellurium 130. Its isoelectronic configuration is the configuration of krypton followed by 4d10, 5s2, and 4p4. Okay, so krypton has atomic number. 36 that means that means for tellurium you've got 36 electrons followed by 10 plus 2 plus 4 which is a total of 52 electrons part a complete table 1.1 by stating the nucleon number, number of electrons and neutrons. So the number of electrons in a tellurium atom as we saw using the electronic conf configuration is 52. The number of neutrons would be the mass number minus the proton number which is equal to the number of electrons in a neutral atom which is 78 and the nucleon number is equal to the mass number b identify the subshell in an atom of tellurium that contains electrons with the lowest energy subshells as you'd learn in as level chemistry are the divisions of shells in an atom so these subshells are s p d and f with one three five and seven orbitals respectively and uh, since each orbital can hold up to two electrons that means the maximum number of electrons in each subshell is 2 6 10 and 14 for spd and f anyway Anyhow, energy of principal shells, that is the first, second and third shells, increases with their increasing quantum number. That means the energy of subshell 2, that means energy of shell 2 is greater than energy of shell 1. Similarly, energy of shell 3 is greater than the energy of shell 2 and so on. Following this, subshells increase, the energy of subshells increases in the order s p d and f with f having the greatest amount of energy and the only exception to this rule is subshell 3d which has higher energy compared to 4s you are supposed to identify the subshell that contains electrons with the lowest energy the closer a principal shell is to the nucleus the lower its energy and energy of subshells increases in this order that means the orbital with this lowest energy would be 1s orbital c construct an equation to represent the first ionization energy of tellurium so ionization energy is the energy required to remove one mole of an electron from one mole of gaseous atoms to produce one mole of positive gaseous ions first ionization energy would simply be the energy for removing the first electron from one mole of gaseous tellurium atoms make sure to write the symbols for tellurium atoms and ion d part one the radius of tellurium ions decreases after each successive ionization energy That means when you remove electrons from outer shell of tellurium atom and then ions, the size of the ion gets smaller and smaller. So here you can see that the last, you can see that 5p4 is the outermost orbital of tellurium. So as you remove an electron from the 5p4 orbital, orbit, 
there are three p orbitals and you've got four electrons when you remove this first electron the radius of tellurium atom to tellurium ion will decrease and then this decrease will continue as you continue to take out electrons from the positive ions state two factors that are responsible for the increase in the first six ionization energies of tellurium first six ionization energies would be the energies required to remove the first six electrons so that would be four electrons from the p orbital four electrons from the p orbital and then the 5s2 electrons you need to think of two reasons because of which energy will change so first off um, you will need greater amount of energy or a higher energy will be required to remove electrons from 5s orbitals compared to 5p because 5s orbitals are closer to the nucleus that means nuclear attraction for these electrons is greater and to overcome this greater attraction you would need greater energy and then the 4p electrons are filled in three orbitals the last or the fourth electron is paired up with another electron we learned that this the this pairing of electrons result in spin pair repulsion which is essentially repulsion between electrons due to their same charge this repulsion will push push the first electron away making it easier to remove the first electron in other words due to this spin pair repulsion the first ionization energy will be relatively smaller and then you would have higher ionization energies for the next three electrons this would be the first reason first reason for change in ionization energy and then secondly this gap between 4p to 4s electrons would also result in a higher energy required to remove electrons from a closer orbital that has in which electrons will experience stronger nuclear attraction which will require greater amount of energy to be overcome part 2 sketch a graph in figure 1.1 to show the trend in the first seven ionization energies of tellurium so the first seven electrons would be the last electron in 4d10 and then 5s2 followed by 5p4 four electrons from 5p two electrons from 5s and one electron would be removed from 4d orbital the important points that you need to understand here is that within the ionization the difference between ionization energy of electrons in the same orbital so that means the ionization energy of the four electrons in 5p orbitals would increase slower compared to the jump in or the gap in ionization energy between 5s and 5p orbitals that's because um, 5s orbital is closer to the nucleus as mentioned earlier so these electrons would experience a greater or a stronger nuclear attraction similarly even though the ionization energy for the fifth and sixth electron in 5s orbital will increase this increase would be smaller compared to the increase in ionization energy between the sixth and seventh electron because the seventh electron would be removed from a 4d orbital which is closer to the nucleus so you would observe larger gaps in ionization energy between the fourth electron and the fifth electron and you would observe an even bigger gap in ionization energy of sixth and seventh electron why is that because not this time not only are you changing the energy level of the orbital you are getting even further 
the dist uh, you are getting even closer to nucleus so the closer you move to the nucleus the stronger the attraction and the larger the gap between ionization energies will become that being said you would still observe a slight increase in ionization energy between electrons of the same orbital because as you re keep removing electrons you would increase the charge on the ion which would make it harder and harder or which would require you to use more and more energy to remove electrons from the positive charge so from the first to the third electron the ionization energy would increase these are the four electrons from 5p orbital and then between fourth and the fifth electron as you jump from the 5p to 5s orbital there would be a larger gap in ionization energy between fifth and sixth electron which are both removed from 5s orbital the rise in ionization energy would be less steep and then lastly the, the increase in ionization sixth and seventh ionization energy would be the most steep e tellurium reacts with fluorine at 150 degrees celsius to form tellurium fluoride molecules of tellurium fluoride are octahedral which means um, <clears throat> there are six bonds around the central atom of tellurium so that means x is equal to 6 the formula would be tef6 with bond angles of 90 degrees explain why tellurium fluoride is octahedral with bond angles of 90 degrees here you will need the knowledge of geometry of molecules so tellurium fluoride has six bonding pairs of electrons around the central tellurium atom all of the bonding pairs of electrons repel each other equally which results in the bond angles of 90 degrees it's important to note that the repulsion between pairs of electrons decreases in the order um, lone pair lone pair lone pair bond pair and bond pair bond pair of electrons what that means is if you've got two lone pairs of electrons let's say for an oxygen atom the repulsion between these two pairs of electrons would be greater compared to the repulsion between this lone pair of electron and this bonding pair of electron and the least amount of the least amount of repulsion bit will be between two pairs of electrons that are involved in a covalent bond f tellurium fluoride reacts with water to form tellurium hydroxide and hydrogen fluoride the oxidation number of tellurium does not change during this reaction okay that means you'll probably need to use or know the oxidation number of tellurium if it doesn't change that means you can find the uh, oxidation number of tellurium in the product using oxidation number of tellurium with the reactant that you start with to find the oxidation number of tellurium well we already know that x is 6 that means you've got 6 fluoride ions that cancel out the charge of one tellurium ion 6 fluoride ions would have a charge of negative 6 given that all halogens have a charge of negative 1 and this is cancelled out or balanced by the charge of one single tellurium ion that means this ion has a charge of plus 6 and that will be the oxidation state of tellurium in the compound 
that's formed during this reaction part one asks you to construct an equation for this reaction so you've got tellurium fluoride reacting with water we know that you'll have hydrogen fluoride as well as tellurium hydroxide now tellurium hydroxide to construct their chemical formula you would write down the symbols of the ions and you would follow that up by writing their valencies below them and then you would just cross them with each other that, that means for each tellurium ion you've got six hydroxide ions in one unit of tellurium hydroxide which is an ionic compound now here you can see six hydroxide ions or six hydrogen atoms as well as six oxygen atoms you would balance that by writing six next to the water molecules so now you have six oxygen atoms on both sides <clears throat> we also have six fluorine atoms on the re reactant side which means you can write six next to the hydrogen fluoride to balance the number of fluorine atoms as well as the number of hydrogen atoms which is 12 on both sides now part 2 asks you to name the type of reaction that occurs when tellurium fluoride reacts with water since this reaction leads to forming new bonds this would be hydrolysis question 2 a neutralization reaction occurs when sodium hydroxide or aqueous sodium hydroxide is added to sulfuric acid the first equation is shown define the enthalpy change of neutralization this is the enthalpy change when which occurs when one mole of water is formed during the reaction between an acid and an alkali you would benefit from memorizing all of the definition of the enthalpy changes so that's combustion neutralization formation solution and hydration as well as knowing the as well as knowing whether each of them is typically endothermic or exothermic so for example enthalpy change of neutralization is always exothermic B. An experiment is carried out to calculate the enthalpy change of neutralization for the reaction between aqueous sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. 100 cm cube and 1 molar sodium hydroxide is added to 75 cm cube and 1 molar sulfuric acid in a polystyrene cup and stirred. The results from the experiment are shown in Table 2.1. We are supposed to use the equation in equation 1 to calculate the amount in moles of sulfuric acid that is neutralized in the experiment. So according to the equation, two moles of sodium hydroxide will be neutralized, will neutralize one mole of sulfuric acid. Now 100 cm cube and one mole molar sodium hydroxide is 100 divided by 1000, which is 0 0.1 moles of sodium hydroxide. You would need half a mole. Similarly, 1 molar and 75 cm cube of sulfuric acid are 0 0.07. So 2 moles of sodium hydroxide will neutralize 1 mole of sulfuric acid according to the equation. That means 0 0.1 moles of sulfuric acid will neutralize. 0 0.05 moles of sulfuric acid part 2 asks you to calculate the enthalpy change of neutralization using results in table 2.1 include units in your answer ok so you are given the data for initial and final temperature of the solution mixture as well as specific heat capacity of the solution and they are asking you to assume that 1 cm cube of the solution has a mass of 1 gram 
no heat is lost to the surroundings full dissociation of sulfuric acid occurs the experiment takes place at constant pressure to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction using heat we can use the formula change in heat divided by the number of moles of the reactant in this case this will be the number of moles of the limiting reagent which is sodium hydroxide and heat the change in heat is the heat gained by the solution the formula of heat gained is equal to volume multiplied by specific heat capacity multiplied by change in temperature and then the number of moles of sodium hydroxide is 0.05 so the volume here will be the total volume of both of the solutions which was hundred cm cube of sodium hydroxide and seventy five cm cube of sulfuric acid. Okay, so in this case, my bad. They're asking you to assume that volume is equal to mass. So they probably want you to write mass instead of volume here so we have 100 plus 75 cm cube which is 175 cm cube and since there's we already have this assumption that means in place of mass you can write 175 grams of the total solution and the specific heat capacity is also given change in temperature would be final temperature would be the final temperature which is 27.8 minus the initial temperature you don't need to convert from degree celsius to kelvin since the change change would be same in both units that's 27.8 minus 20 divided by the number of moles this comes out to 57,100 joules per mole I prefer to convert it to kilojoules per mole by dividing by 1000 which is negative 57.1 kilojoule per mole the negative sign is important because this is an exothermic reaction which means heat is given out see part 1 Complete the equation for the reaction that occurs when a solution of barium hydroxide is added to aqueous sulfuric acid include state symbols. So you react barium hydroxide with sulfuric acid. Um, this forms a character pre characteristic precipitate of barium sulfate, which is insoluble. So you'll write the solid state symbol as well as water. On the reactant side, you've got four uh, hydrogen atoms in total. That means you need to balance that out here now we have 4 plus 2 6 4 and 6 oxygen atoms so that leaves us with a balanced equation oh and water needs the state symbol as well liquid part 2 asks you to suggest why the enthalpy change of neutralization cannot be determined using the addition of dilute sulfuric acid to aqueous barium hydroxide that's because the conversion or the, the formation of a solid precipitate also involves uh, energy change. During this precipitation reaction, some potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. So that means enthalpy change or the heat transfer to the solution which we calculated earlier cannot be calculated accurately for this experiment. Chlorine is a very reactive element. A chlorine reacts with silicon to form silicon chloride. So here you've got the oxidation state of silicon. Describe the appearance of silicon chloride at room temperature and pressure. State its structure and bonding. Silicon chloride is <coughs> a covalent compound. So it will have covalent bonds as well as a simple molecular structure. It appearance is a colorless liquid at room temperature
B samples of magnesium chloride and phosphorus chloride are added to separate beakers of cold water. Complete table 3.1. Ignore temperature changes when considering observations for these reactions. So you are supposed to compare starting with appearance at room temperature. Magnesium chloride is a is an ionic compound, so it's a solid at room temperature. White solid, particularly. Whereas phosphorus chloride is a okay, phosphorus chloride is also a white solid. The observation in similarity on addition to cold water. So magnesium chloride, both of them form colorless solution. Only difference is phosphorus where phosphorus chloride gets hydrolyzed or reacts with water, magnesium chloride gets dissolved in water, it doesn't react, which is why you will have the difference in observation on addition to cold water. Magnesium chloride will just dissolve into the magnesium and chloride ions, whereas phosphorus chloride will react with water and it will produce phosphoric acid as well as hydrogen chloride which will be produced as a gas and you will be able to observe this in the form of steamy fumes whereas you don't see any fumes in case of magnesium chloride now uh, as for the pH of final solution magnesium chloride is a neutral compound so the pH would be close to 7 whereas uh, phosphorus, phosphorus chloride will produce an acidic solution due to the products so that will result in a pH close to 3 C1 state the reagent and conditions required for the formation of sodium chlorate from chlorine gas sodium chlorate where chlorine has an oxidation number of plus 5 is this compound which is formed from a dispersionation reaction when you react sodium when, when you react chlorine with hot aqueous sodium hydroxide so the, the equation of the reaction In the equation of the reaction, you will see that you have 5 moles of sodium chloride as well as 1 mole of sodium chlorate and lastly water. Part 2. Explain why the reaction in C part 1 is described as a disproportionation reaction your answer should refer to relevant species and their oxidation numbers so disproportionation reaction is a reaction where the oxidation number of the same species will increase and decrease so in the reactant you will have um, chlorine in its molecular form which has an oxidation state of zero and this will go to minus one in sodium chloride okay so this is the a decrease in oxidation state of chlorine you would also observe an increase in oxidation state of chlorine this chlorate ion over here to find out the oxidation state of chlorine you would have um, 3 into 2 this is negative 1 so the oxidation state of chlorine in sodium chlorate is plus 5 so the oxidation state has increased this due to this increase and decrease in oxidation states this reaction is called disproportionation reaction d chlorine reacts with methane in a series of reactions to produce chloroalkanes part one state the conditions required for chlorine to react with methane the reaction between halogen and alkanes is free radical substitution reaction which requires uv light 
alkanes are very unreactive and this is the only reaction that we study in our syllabus part 2 one of the products of the reaction is CH2Cl2 which reacts further to produce CHCl3 complete table 3.2 to show the details of the mechanisms that form CHCl3 from CH2Cl2 this is again a free radical substitution since a hydrogen is replaced by the third chlorine initiation so you're going to begin with the initiation step which will produce free radicals from chlorine the halogen you have you'll start with a chlorine molecule which will break down to produce two chlorine radicals the reason these are called radicals is that they have an unpaired electron which makes them highly unstable and this also makes them react or collide with another stable species to produce a to produce a second radical which we'll see in the second step or propagation so this chlorine radical will knock out a hydrogen atom and produce CHCl2 radical and the hydrogen will combine with the chlorine radical to produce a stable product so this second radical will then go on to react with another radical two unstable species will react in the termination step to form the last product now because you have chcl3 in the product and you have this radical chcl2 that means you need to react it with a chlorine radical which you had formed in the first step to form the final product in this reaction uh, you could have also had products that formed from a reaction between two CHCl2 radicals let's say we had two CHCl2 radicals reacting together then you would have had for C2H2Cl4 but that's not what the question is asking about so we only write about uh, write the equation which is required in the question E CHCl3 and hydrogen fluoride are used to form CHCl2 in a substitution reaction construct an equation for this reaction so two of the chlorine atoms in CHCl3 will be substituted by fluorine atoms because fluorine is more reactant so you have CHCl3 reacting with hydrogen fluoride since you need to substitute two of these chlorine atoms that means you would need at least two hydrogen fluoride molecules to produce CHClF2 and then these hydrogens from hydrogen fluoride will react with the removed chlorine atoms to produce two hydrogen fluoride molecules F part F X is a product of the substitution reaction that occurs between CHClF2 uh, reacting with bromine there is only one naturally occurring isotope of a fluorine which is fluorine with a mass number of 19 the mass spectrum of X shows molecular ion peaks at mass over electron ratio of 164 66 and 68 so the lowest peak is the M peak which will give the mass of the molecule that has the lightest weighing isotopes of the halogens then you will have m plus 2 peak that means either the 81 bromine isotope or chlorine 37 isotope and then lastly you have 168 which is the m plus 4 peak that means both um, both chlorine and bromine are present in their heavier isotope so, anyhow you don't need to worry about the formula since it's already given okay let me start with stating that the difference that you see in mass to charge ratio uh, there there's a difference between their values of two so 164 to 6 and 66 to 8 you see a difference in two you don't see a difference by one 
that means this difference occurs due to difference in mass of the isotopes of halogens and not, not carbon atom if the difference was due to uh, carbon isotopes then you would see m and m plus one peak due to carbon 12 and carbon 13 however you only see m plus two and m plus four peak which is peaks which is an indication that this occurs due to chlorine and bromine isotopes we are already given the formula cf2 clbr and of course the heaviest mass over charge peak has the heavier isotope of both of the halogens now they are asking you to show all the molecular ions, ions responsible for each peak the m peak has a mass of 164 m plus 2 peak has a mass of 166 m plus 4 peak has a mass of 168 so you add plus 2 and then plus 4 this plus 4 means you are adding the mass of the two heavier isotopes of chlorine and bromine whereas m peak will be due to the lighter isotopes which is chlorine 35 and bromine 79 now if for the m plus 2 peak you could have either cf2 chlorine 37 so you increase the mass by 2 with the lighter isotope of bromine or this could be due to the is due to the peak where chlorine weighs lighter and bromine weighs heavier question 4 v is a colorless liquid it reacts with an excess of lithium aluminum hydride to form w so lithium aluminum hydride is a reducing agent which will reduce aldehydes ketones and carboxylic acids to alcohols carboxylic acid is always um, reduced to a primary alcohol which means the structure of W will consist of a primary alcohol now remember that even though lithium aluminum hydride is a reducing alcohol it's not strong enough to reduce the alkene the only reagent that's strong enough to do that is hydrogen hydrogen with a catalyst most commonly nickel so W in any case would be a primary alcohol with hydroxyl group in place of the carboxylic acid. Identify the role of lithium aluminum hydride in this reaction. Once again this is a reducing agent. We reacts to form Z in a single reaction as shown in figure 4.2 so in this reaction what's happening is this alkene is getting converted to a dihydroxyl and this is the result of mild oxidation and for this you will use cold dilute potassium manganate such as the uh, reagent and conditions so that's your answer right there you will need cold dilute potassium manganate to form a diol with two hydroxyl groups from an alkene part two deduce the empirical formula of z you will need the molecular formula to deduce the empirical formula so you've got one two three four carbon atoms that is c4 and then you've got Okay, you know what? Let me just draw out the displayed structure. CH2, CHOH, and then again you've got CH2, OH. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 hydrogen atoms, and then 4 oxygen atoms. Once you simplify that, you'll get CH2O as the empirical formula. For Z. Part 3 complete table 4.1 to show the number of sp2 and sp3 hybridized carbon atoms that are present in a molecule of V. Wait, so here's V. Carbon atoms that are involved in double bonds are sp2 hybridized and looking at the structure of V you've got three carbon atoms that are sp2 hybridized 
which means and sp3 are the carbon atoms that have four single bonds so that's just one over here one carbon atom that's sp3 hybridized part c q contains the elements carbon hydrogen and oxygen only it is a saturated molecule a saturated molecule means that it doesn't have any double bond so if a if a molecule contains carbon hydrogen and oxygen and it doesn't have any double bond that means it can't be an aldehyde it can't be a ketone it can't be a carboxylic acid that leaves us with an uh, that 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 means q has to be an alcohol that has all single bonds with carbon hydrogen and oxygen atoms it has no branching in its carbon backbone that means you don't have an alkene an alkene group either q contains only one functional group which is most probably alcohol the relative molecular mass of q is 88 no effervescence is seen when sodium carbonate is added to q so sodium carbonate being a base does not react with q that means again q is not an acid because if it did react with q that means there there would have been a carboxylic acid group which reacts with the base to produce effervescence due to carbon dioxide but that's not happening so q does not have carboxylic acid group effervescence is seen when sodium is added to q and that's because sodium reacts with an alcohol to produce sodium salt as well as hydrogen gas which will produce the effervescence q reacts with alkaline i aquacidine to form yellow precipitate so that means q undergoes iodoform reaction to produce this precipitate to undergo uh, iod this reaction an alcohol needs to have a methyl group that's bonded to a carbon atom which on which you will find the hydroxyl group so we already know a q will have this because it gives a positive result with aqueous alkaline iodine forming iodoform solid or iodoform precipitate so now we know the mass number of q is 88 it doesn't have any atoms other than carbon hydrogen and oxygen it has an alcohol group which has this structure ch3 oh the remaining from now what you're going to do is you will subtract the mass of this part of the molecule from the total mass and then the remaining mass will be due to carbon and hydrogen atoms only so the mass of this part of the molecule will consist of the mass of the two carbon atoms four hydrogen atoms and an oxygen which is 44 you subtract that from 88 and you are left with 44 now one of that okay i'll subtract one more from this 44 because i want to add the mass of hydrogen that is also bonded to this carbon atom now you're supposed to complete the structure of this molecule using carbon and hydrogen atoms only so that you make up a mass of 43 let's start with a combination of carbon and hydrogen atoms obviously that can't just be ch3 so let's look at ch2 ch3 that will be 24 plus 7 which is not 44 again you could do three carbon atoms or c3h7 which is 43 that means other than this part which reacts with aqueous alkaline iodine you will have c3h7 that fulfills all the requirement of structure q and you are supposed to draw the structure since all the structures previously uh, that we saw in the question were skeletal formulae 
I'll go ahead and draw the skeletal formula of Q as well. Question 5a. Molecule M is present in petrol, a fuel used in cars. M is saturated. So again, all single bonds non-cyclic hydrocarbon hydrocarbon means a compound that has carbon and hydrogen atoms only it contains eight carbon atoms so m is an alkene is a straight chain alkane with eight carbon atoms that means m is octane which is ch c8 h18 construct an equation for the complete combustion of m so m reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water need to balance out the number of carbon atoms that means eight carbon dioxide molecules and then nine water molecules which leaves us with 25 oxygen molecules on the product side and you need to balance that on the reactant side as well Part 2. Describe how the composition of products differs when incomplete combustion of M occurs. Incomplete combustion of M occurs when you don't have sufficient oxygen. That means you don't have enough oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. Instead, what you will end up with is some carbon, some carbon monoxide and some, even some unburned hydrocarbon because you don't have enough oxygen in the first place to complete the reaction. When petrol is burned, is burned in an internal combustion engine, oxides of nitrogen are released into the atmosphere which are responsible for the formation of acid rain. So just the conditions required for the production of oxides of nitrogen during combustion of M or combustion of octane in an internal combustion engine use appropriate equation in your answer. For the production of oxides of nitrogen, you would need high temperature to break the strong triple bond between nitrogen atoms because they need a lot of energy to be broken. And as for the reaction, you would have nitrogen react with oxygen to produce nitrogen monoxide. Part 2. Describe how acid rain is formed in the atmosphere in the presence of oxides of nitrogen and sulfur dioxide. Identify the role of oxides of nitrogen in this process. So you'll have oxides of nitrogen and sulfur dioxide that will combine and produce acid rain. Identify the role of oxides of nitrogen in this process. Include all relevant equations. And this is a 3 mark answer. So they're going to be... Essentially, um, what happens during this reaction is sulfur dioxide will be oxidized to sulfur trioxide and oxides of nitrogen will be acting as catalysts. Then the sulfur trioxide will get dissolved in water or the rainwater to produce sulfuric acid which causes the acid rain. This is a homogeneous catalysis since both sulfur um, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide and their catalyst, the oxides of nitrogen are in gaseous state. So I'll start with stating how nitrogen dioxide acts as a catalyst. during the uh, oxidation of sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide and this occurs via the reaction shown by this equation so you end up with nitrogen monoxide and then this nitrogen monoxide will then react with oxygen to produce 
nitrogen monoxide to produce nitrogen dioxide so as you can see nitrogen dioxide is regenerated which a catalyst is never used up it is always regenerated by the end of the reaction part 3 state one other type of air pollution that's caused by production of oxides of nitrogen in an internal combustion engine well, it causes photochemical smog which is um, which is harmful for the respiratory health of humans Part C, biodiesel T is a fuel made from vegetable oil R. Figure 5.1 shows the production of T from R in a two-step process. So in the first step, you have this ester molecule. You have three ester bonds, which are made up of three carboxylic acid tails and an alcohol group that has that must have had three hydroxyl group to form three ester bonds. Anyhow, you are breaking this bond to produce the parent carboxylic acid as well as the parent alcohol molecule. So, J must have, J must be this parent alcohol which has three carbon atoms in the backbone. So, it is CH2OH, CHOH and CH2OH. Right, I draw the skeletal formula here for J. All right, and then L will undergo a reaction which is heating with G as well as concentrated sulfuric acid to produce a new ester where the parent alcohol is methanol since there is only one carbon atom on the alcohol side of the ester part 1. In step 1, all three ester groups in R react suggest a suitable reagent and conditions for step 1. So, step 1 is a hydrolysis reaction where uh, addition of water will break down the ester bonds. And you will need to heat the reactants with sulfuric acid or dilute sulfuric acid. Part 2 draw the structural formula of J in the box, which we have already done. Name the type of reaction that occurs in step 2. So, in step 2, you have an a carboxylic acid reacting with an alcohol, which also produces water as a byproduct. So, this is a condensation reaction since a water molecule is produced. Name organic reagent Q used in step 2. So, uh, organic reagent G, my bad. So, this reagent is the alcohol which reacts with the parent carboxylic acid to produce the ester. And as you highlighted earlier, this part of the ester has one carbon atom only coming from the alcohol. That means G was methanol. L is called decanoic acid because it has 10 carbon atoms. Use systematic nomenclature to deduce the name of T. Okay. While naming a carboxylic acid, you always start with the name of the alcohol, which was methanol. So, you will start by methyl following with the name of the parent acid. So, that would be the canoid. And this is it. We are done with this paper. Thank you for watching.